and welcome to episode 31 of Board Game Blitz, a proud member of the Dice Tower Network and a podcast about all things board games that you can listen to in less time than it takes to get through the TSA line because the guy in front of you somehow didn't realize he needed to take off his shoes. This week, we'll all be on vacation as this episode releases, so we're talking about games that travel well. First, we discuss a few games we've played recently, like Fourth Age, 1817, Kitten Clash, and Baron Park. Then, we talk about games that are good to travel with. Finally, we wrap things up with a look at the etymology of the word score. And now, here are your hosts, Ambie, Cassidy, and me, Crystal. Last week, I got to go to Portland 18XX Tournament. It's not really a tournament, but everyone who plays records their scores and gets ranked, but most people don't really care about the tournament, but it's called a tournament. Anyway, there are a bunch of 18xx games in the library, and Toby and I played six games, two on Thursday, three on Friday, and one on Saturday. We decided to take it easier than other conventions, like we actually went out to eat and explored Portland, which was nice, and we got eight hours of sleep each night, because 18xx games are exhausting, so... We couldn't play all night. (laughs) But the most played games at the convention were probably 1822, which actually won the Heavy Cardboard Golden Elephant Award this year, and 1817, which we got to play. We had a really fun time, and I wrote a blog about it on our website. But a couple highlights are I got to play Fourth Age in 1817. So about a year ago, I had heard that there's a Lord of the Rings-themed 18xx game called Fourth Age. It's not published, but some people had played it, and a couple copies exist. So I've been wanting to play it, but I never thought I'd get the chance to even see it. But someone brought a copy of it, of Fourth Age, to the convention, and we got to play it with the designer, Rick Dutton. You might have seen my Twitter pictures about it, and I was super excited to play it. So Fourth Age is a re-theme of 1870, which I haven't played yet. And there are some differences. The map is Middle Earth, and the companies have special powers. The coolest powers, I thought, were the orc companies, which don't have to pay terrain costs to build. So usually it costs extra to build over rivers and mountains. But since there are so many orcs, it's like cheap labor. So (laughs) they get to build track for free. And also the orcs... That's awesomely thematic. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) For an ATXX game. (laughs) Yeah. Also, the orcs can destroy track, whereas usually you can only build an upgrade track, but the orcs can destroy it. It didn't end up being very useful in the game, but it sounded really cool. (laughs) <laughs> and the rest of the powers were like bonuses where you get to destinations. For example, the elves need to reach the Grey Havens to get a bonus. So I had fun with that. The other game we played that was really fun was 1817, and we got to play it with experts. So I talked about 1817 in our last episode. It's an epic 18xx game focused on financial shenanigans. But there's a group in Seattle that's been playing it every week for like three years or something. So they're really good at it. <laughs> That's intense. Yeah. That, yeah, that, I, I know that the listeners to the podcast can't see my face right now, but that is, <laughs> that is crazy, crazy go nuts. Yeah. So we had heard about them and Toby and I had wanted to play 1817 with them just to see like how they played and all the possibilities of the game. And we were able to play with a couple of them and it was really cool. We got to learn a lot, like what you want to think about when you're shorting companies, when you want to take loans. We learned that two plus trains are really good and three trains are poison, they called it. And uh, you could take loans to double jump on the stock track. A lot that of train things. is poison. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, so we're looking forward to playing more of 1817 with our friends here. 1817 is actually available to buy for about $250 from All Aboard Games. So it sounds expensive, but the fact that this group played it like over like hundreds of times proves that it's really replayable. And also like the fact that the reason it's expensive is that it's made by hand by Scott, who's who's all aboard games. His name's Scott. And every game is basically a high quality print and play game. And there's a lot of components in 1817. But it's it seems like it's worth it because you can get hundreds of plays out of it. And our group has oh, only had two so far, so we've got a lot yeah, of plays I mean, left. People pay, you know, easily close to that for miniature war games and stuff like mm-hmm. that too. It's just funny how nonchalantly they say things like, <laughs> Oh, it just costs two hundred and fifty dollars. Like I think the key was that you could actually purchase it. That is yeah. key. Because a lot of the games that you play are not readily available, so Yeah. Well, that's very cool. So you had fun at Port- Portland 18XX tournament slash con slash whatever we want to call it? Yep. 
<laughs> yeah, I think it's called tournament, but I didn't treat it like a tournament. <laughs> I mean, I called it con, I think, when I tweeted about yeah. it in yeah. advance or, like, whatever, so... Yeah, I think I, I was calling it that, too. It, it <laughs> kind of, for all intents and purposes, is a convention that just happens mm-hmm. to have a tournament aspect, I would imagine. Yeah. Very cool. Well, thanks for the tournament report. <laughs> <laughs> Not con report. Tournament Not con report. report. <laughs> Very different. Well, as has been my theme the last <laughs> few episodes, I'm going to take Ambie's very heavy game and just... <laughs> flip it around backwards upside down and over and go to probably the lightest game I've ever played in my entire life which is Kitten Clash <laughs> I say this is the lightest game I've ever played in my entire entire life because one it's only two player so anything two player is usually pretty short-ish in comparison to more players and this game will literally take you two minutes to play two minutes that's it <laughs> this is the blitziest of blitz games I've ever played <laughs> Yep. I was very lucky to actually meet the designers of Kitten Clash, Alice and Matt, at Origins, and they were wonderful people. I loved them. They were um, working the Daily Magic Games booth, which is who published their Kitten Clash game for them, and they were lovely people too. So in Kitten Clash, you choose to be ninja cats or pirate cats, and then each of you gets a stack of cards, and the cards have different colors on them. I think there's, I want to say four, five different colors, and then a gray color, which is a random color, or wild color. And each of you are simultaneously taking your cards and flipping them over one by one into three separate stacks. And as you get pairs, or as you see two of the same color, you just grab them. And they can be on your side, they can be on your opponent's side, they can be on both sides, just as long as the pairs are next to each other. And then at the end of the game, you get score, you score for... Every two points for your opponent's card and every one point for your card. So at the end of the game, whoever has most points wins. If it's a tie, you play again. And that's Kitten Clash. (laughs) Two minutes. It's lovely. It's the best filler game I think I've seen. I actually got to break it out at my regular Wednesday night since I got there so early. And they were kind enough to give you a couple extra copies of the game to send to us. So Mm -hmm. hooray! Yeah. Yes, they were lovely people. <laughs> and we thank you guys so much. Uh, you said Allison and Matt were their names. Is that correct? It was Alice and Matt. Yeah, Alice, Alice. and Matt. Oh, Alice and Matt. I apologize. Yep. Thank you guys very, very much for doing that. We greatly appreciate it. And we are happy to, you know, I am allergic to cats, but luckily I'm not <laughs> allergic to cat-related board games. So, <laughs> And I got the chance to play it too. And I really like speed games, so I had a lot of fun with that. I don't generally enjoy speed games, but this one is over so fast that I'm like, all right, this is fine. Yeah. I still haven't gotten to play it. I've been un- I've been fortunately or unfortunately really busy testing my roll and write game design for the Gen Cant mm. contest. And by the time that this episode comes out, I will have submitted that design. Whether it's good or bad, I don't know <laughs> yet. My friends seem to like it, but... They're, they're, they're either really good liars or they actually like playing it. So one of those two things is true. But uh, it's getting submitted, so we'll see how that goes. It's the first game I've ever designed, so that had to happen eventually. And it did. But uh, real game designers make real games. And one of those games that, <laughs> that I have gotten to play recently is Baron Park. So as Origins was going on, and I saw everybody talking about what they were seeing and playing at the con, I was growing increasingly more and more interested in this game. It's from Mayfair Games, and it's for two to four players, and it takes around 45 minutes to play, probably less with uh, two players, but I've only played it with the four-player player player count so far. And I was happy to find out that a week after Origins, the new board game cafe here in Vegas that I am frequenting all the time, Tables Board Game Spot, they got a copy of it! So... It's similar to games like Patchwork and Cottage Garden in that it utilizes polyominoes, which are tiles that are shaped. If you've ever played Tetris, it's similar to that. Tetris, they have four squares. Polyominoes have a variable number of squares in them. The game forces players to strategically play them to best fill their board and earn victory points. On a player's turn, they can place one tile onto their board and their board has a number of icons on it, and the icons that are covered by the placed piece will determine what new pieces the player can collect from the supply. So there's like small green tiles to really large enclosures, 
players have to carefully select which pieces they actually want to pick up because the smaller ones aren't really usually worth any victory points, but they'll help you fill in your board. Whereas the big ones are harder to place, but they're usually worth more points. So balancing whether to take the small one to finish that one tile on your board or to take a large tile, which will get you more points and possibly a bonus. It's a, it's an enjoyable struggle, I much must say. So I enjoy patchwork, but I don't play a lot of two-player games, so I don't really play it that often. I haven't played Cottage Garden, and truthfully, based on the descriptions that other people had given of it in the reviews, I wasn't really super digging it or into it. Like, I, I wasn't amped to play it, but I adore Baron Park. And like many of the games that I tend to gush about here on the podcast, it's simple to learn, but it has interesting strategy within and those are the types of games that I really gravitate toward. I honestly think this game is going to blow up even more as the summer progresses. Like as people go to Dice Tower Con and Gen Con, if assuming Mayfair is getting a lot of copies of it out there, I would not be surprised if this game turns into something very big because it is a lot of fun. And Cassidy, I know you have gotten to play it too because you were at Origins. You were one of the people I was jealous of. So I'd be curious <laughs> to hear your thoughts about it as well. I actually purchased it before I even had a chance to play. <laughs> and that was almost immediately after I picked up my own copy of Cottage Garden. I don't know why I decided I needed both, <laughs> but apparently I needed both in my life at that exact moment. I played both now, Cottage Garden and Baron Park. I like both for slightly different reasons. Cottage Garden has a solo version written into the rules, and I like that. Baron Park has amazing little toilet pieces that <laughs> blow my mind. <laughs> the toilet pieces are my favorite. Oh. <laughs> they're, they're useless, except for to spill, fill that one little square. But they're, oh man, as soon as I saw those, I died. Toilets. <laughs> I mean, people, people gotta it's do business. It's a theme park. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta, yeah. yeah. Anyone who ever played uh, Roller Coaster Tycoon, in, in a, you know, 20 years ago or whenever that game was popular, they know that if you if you don't clean up after park guests, things get ugly quickly. <laughs> you gotta drop your kids off at the pool. <laughs> oh, you did not. You did not. <laughs> Cassidy, you are fired. <laughs> no, I really, I really like Baron Park. Uh, I've played it a handful of times now, and it will stay around for a while. Yeah, I really liked it. I I'm, I haven't added it to my collection yet, but I'm going to be adding it very soon. I've got a gift certificate for Cool Stuff Inc. And I am I know they're, they're going to be at Dice Tower Con, so I wonder if I'll be able to use my digital gift certificate in person? We'll see. But Maybe. I don't plan on coming back with a ton of, game, ton of games. So I, I really want to try very part because I like patchwork and like I like those puzzle type games, and so it's on my want to play list, but I haven't had the chance yet. Baron Park was easier to learn than Cottage Garden. They're basic, they're very similar games, but the rules were way more concise in Baron Park. It took me two minutes to read through the rule book and another two minutes to figure out how to play. It was okay. lovely. Nice. Yeah, it's, it's great. Well done, Mayfair Games. And. Oh my gosh, I didn't even look at who the designer was. It's in my brain and I just, it's not like leaving my brain. I'm yeah. looking it up because I genuinely, oh, it's Phil Walker Harding, of course. So he designed stuff like Sushi Go and, oh, um, um, the one Spiel nominee last year with the pyramid, the e Egyptian theme. Uh, Imhotep? It? Yes, Imhotep. Yeah, I was he, just thinking that. Yes, he also designed that. He's, uh, so I think he's been around for a while, but I feel like he's hitting his stride potentially right now. Yeah, good job, Phil Walker Harding. Two thumbs up. <laughs> so the date of the uh, this episode's release is July 6th. So if you happen to be listening to it on the day it releases, Ambie and I are currently at Dice Tower Con. Hooray! Yay! Yay! It started yesterday which we're obviously recording this in the past, so that's weird to say, but it started yesterday on July 5th, and w I can tell you, or future Crystal probably thinks that she's having a lot of fun right now. That's all I know. Yeah. Except the humidity. Hoof, man, it's just killer. Florida. That's why we're inside. Yeah, that's true. 
Um, but if you are at Dice Tower Con, I don't know why you're listening to our podcast instead of playing games, but maybe you're uh, chilling out or taking a break and you happen to be listening to it, you should come find us. Ambie and I will probably be wearing Blitz t-shirts for a good portion of the week at least. I have Every some other board day. game. Oh, okay, you're wearing <laughs> no, <not today>. <laughs> <laughs> I uh I don't I'm probably not gonna wear a blitz shirt every day, but I will have a blitz <laughs> ribbon on my badge. So you should come and find us and say hello because we would love to meet you if you are a listener mm-hmm. of the show. So please, please, please come and do that. Maybe we can play a game together. No promises, obviously. Uh yeah, but the reason that we picked the theme we did this week is since um, Ambie and I are going to be at Dice Tower Con and Cassidy is actually on vacation this week as well, we thought it would be a good time to talk about games that are good to play when traveling. And we've kind of had a similar discussion in the past. Our very first episode, way back in May of 2016, was actually about conventions. And we did talk a little bit about games that you can kind of play in line at a convention and stuff like that. But we wanted to more holistically talk about just games that are good for travel in general this time around. A lot of people travel over the summer, not just to board game conventions, but with family, vacations, other stuff like that. So let's, uh, so what, guys, what are some good games to bring with you when you're traveling in general? I think something that's good to bring when you're traveling is like small box games because they'll fit in your luggage or in whatever your pocket so some games that we've talked about a lot on the podcast are oink games oink games all come in the same little small box and they're all quite different games and all of them are very good i usually (laughs) i kind of describe the size of that box as like if you took two regular decks of playing cards and put them next to each other that's about them yeah yeah like that's about the size of an oink box like that's probably not perfect but it's a good representation i'd say yeah but if you want to talk about games that travel just based on size (laughs) then maybe we need to talk about how many paco games games you can fit into an oink games box (laughs) oh yeah we got back to that thing we uh we know that the designer of the Paco Games is very proud of the fact that his are even smaller than Mm -hmm. the Oink Games. And the Paco Games games are great. There are a whole bunch of really good ones, both in the first line and the second line. And those are literally the size of a pack of gum. So yeah, if you're looking for something portable in that it won't take up space in your luggage, those are definitely two sets of games that are great go-tos. And there's different types of games within both of those lines. So Mm -hmm. it's not like oh, I only like this type of game. Well, chances are one of the games in those lines would suffice because there's a whole bunch of different kinds. Everything from set collection to auctioning to social deduction, like a whole bunch of different genres, all in tiny boxes. Mm -hmm. And I actually, so something I've learned um, while traveling is that the game box itself doesn't always necessarily need to be tiny because... Uh, something that a lot of board gamers uh, find when they buy games is often the box is far bigger than is necessary to hold the components. So what you what I will often do is I'll take a game that has a too big box and I'll shift, I'll take out any insert that exists and I'll shift all the components over to one side and then I will open up other game boxes and take the components from those games and put them all into one box. Like when I went to Kansas City to visit my family, Uh, back at the end of May, I think, I don't remember what the final total was, but I believe I fit seven or eight different games into the Sagrada box without the insert. And that's not, there was one Oink game, but no Paco game games. It was all like actual other games all in one box. So don't let the box size always hinder you as well, because you can theoretically consolidate stuff and that works too. Yeah, one of my friends does that with Ziploc bags. He has the gallon Ziploc bags, so he puts like a game in Ziploc bags and then he has just a big bag of a bunch of games. So he doesn't even bring any box. That's cool. Just note that if you are uh, flying, the TSA will see a (laughs) box full of stuff that they can't identify and will often pull you out of the line for just a brief moment to check it out. They've always been very kind to me when that has happened. And sometimes they're like, oh, that looks really neat. Like they, (laughs) you know, it's not often that they're board gamers, but they're usually pretty kind. What I tend to do when I'm flying is if I'm traveling with a heavily packed 
box of board game components, I'll pull it out along with the laptop. I'll literally just put mm-hmm. it in its own bin so they can see what it is. Because I when they when you put it through the scanner in the bag, I feel like they get more you know like uh, shady about stuff. So I'm just like, nope, here's a board game. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's good. Yeah, I always get stopped for card games. I think the the density is weird or something. They yeah. I don't have any uh, reference for flying with board games. <laughs> Well, if you were on an airplane and you had to bring some board games or you wanted to, what what do you think you would want to bring or what want to play? Honestly, I would probably just take my tablet because I have, I think, 15 board game iterations on my tablet. So to keep things simple and light, I, I would do that. And especially over the past couple of years... Board game apps have really stepped up their game. There are a lot of really good implementations of board games in app versions now. Oh, yeah. Friday just came out. I need to get that. (laughs) I actually just downloaded the Mr. Jack Pocket app because it was on sale for 99 cents. I do not guarantee that it is still on sale when this episode releases. I don't think it will be. So apologies to anyone who hears that and gets excited. But I like Mr. Jack. I don't like Mr. Jack Pocket quite as much as Mr. Jack, but it's still fun. Uh, my husband and I have actually played Quicks, the dice rolling roll and write game on an airplane before, but mm. I was worried about like making other people mad with the dice rolling noise on the tray. <laughs> so I put my sweater like flat onto the tray and then we rolled dice onto that. So that way it kind of deadened the noise and nobody was paying any attention to us. So oh, that works. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I find it hard to play games on the tray a lot of times. Like so- sometimes some card games work, but then I- any game that takes up too much table space, it's kind of hard to play on an airplane tray. So I think the app idea is really good. So let's say you're not flying. Let's say you're piling everybody into the car or the van or a VW bus and you're hitting the road to go on a road trip or to go camping. What are some good games that you could play either in a car to kill time or we'll do that first. So like in a car, if you want to kill time, what could you play? I'm trying to think of something that just doesn't take up a lot of space because you're not going to have a lot of space in the car. True. I think it's also it's do you want to include the driver or not? Because I think passengers could more easily play a number of games. Whereas if you want to include the driver, your options are more limited. But I did think of one, I think Spyfall would actually be pretty easy to do oh, yeah. with, with everyone. And obviously that would potentially require everyone either being familiar with all of the possible locations or having a reference sheet, which the driver wouldn't be able to use a reference sheet because, yeah. you know, watching the road is important. But if they were <laughs> already familiar, then I think Spyfall would be a great one for a car because all you're doing is asking each other questions. Yeah. That'd be good. Or like when, uh, like 20 questions is not really a board game, but we normally do games like that, 20 questions, or uh, there's some other games that are similar to that. So I wonder if Insider would work. I mean, truthfully, yeah, because yeah. the only table requirement is like they have the deck of cards and you flip it over, but you could just hand... Ooh, but then, no, that's tough because especially if you're in like a big car, because Mm -hmm. the one person has to flip the card over and then someone else has to open their eyes. So basically you'd have to somewhat how pass the deck to everyone so it was (laughs) fair, but then people wouldn't be opening their eyes to look at it. And that might be, I bet you could figure out a way to do it, but I'm not quite sure how the logistics would work. If you're willing to omit the driver from the fun I think telestrations would actually be really fun in a car, especially because if the road was bumpy, like the drawings <laughs> might be a little bit less clean and polished than they typically are. So I think that would be pretty fun. And we actually, in college, we used to play like a non-board game version of telestrations where you just write a sentence on a paper and then fold it over and then the next person draws the sentence and you keep folding it over. So instead of starting with the telestrations words or whatever, you can just start with a sentence that you make up. And then you just need a piece of paper and pencils. Well, and technically, Telestrations is a re-implementation of a different game, if I recall, called Eat Poop You Cat. I believe that's the actual oh, name yeah, of I the think, game. Uh... Yeah, I believe that is correct. So I think that might be what we played, although we called it the paper game. So I don't... <laughs> <laughs> many different I mean... names. <laughs> um, so let's say you got in the car, you drove somewhere, now you're at a campsite. 
Uh, I know that I have heard a lot of people like to play Ultimate Werewolf around a campfire. Yes. Because it's spooky. <laughs> yeah, spooky theme. I used to well, I used to play Mafia, but it's basically the same thing. <laughs> right. Bananagrams. <laughs> there you go. Always and that, bananagrams. Also, uh, we can theoretically reference uh, people, have people go back to our episode that was about outdoor games, games that are good to play outside. And of course the episode number is escaping me, but our, the lovely Ambie will probably be awesome and put a link to that episode in the show notes. Oh, now I will. Okay. Do a future Ambie. Future <laughs> yes, Ambie's on it. Hey, note to future Ambie, please put a link to the outdoor game episode in the show notes for those who want to get more information about games that are good to play outdoors. Oh, yeah. I just played Sagrada outside a couple weeks ago. Oh, yeah, because there's not really, I mean, like, you've got the cards, but once you get one little token on them, they're not going to blow away. So, oh, I love Sagrada so much. Though the table, it's one of those, like, iron ones that isn't a flat surface and has a bunch of little holes in it. So I had to take play mats outside <laughs> to play on it because the dice were fa- would fall through the holes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, then they're cocked and you can't tell what number they're on, probably. All right, well, so those are some games that you can play while traveling or on the road or in a plane or elsewhere. We would love to hear what your favorite games are to play when you are traveling. So hit us up on Twitter or our Board Game Geek Guild and let us know which games you like to play. For this week's etymology segment, I'm gonna look at the origins of the word score in its noun form. Score comes from the Old English scoru, meaning 20, which can be traced back to the Old Norse score, S-K-O-R, meaning mark, notch, incision, or rift in a rock. The current day verb score, meaning to cut with incisions or notches, obviously is traced back through a similar path and helps explain how the noun form of the word found its present meaning. The means of counting large numbers of often livestock or something of that ilk, was called vigisimilism and was accomplished by making a notch in a stick for each set of 20 that was counted. In English, score has been used in a number of different ways. In the 1400s, it meant a mark made to keep track of a customer's drinks in a tavern. That sense was then extended by the late 17th century to mean a mark made for the purpose of recording a point in a game or match, which then eventually turned into a different definition of aggregate of points made by contestants in certain games and matches. If you'll begrudge me a small trip down a rabbit hole here, that last definition is first notated as being used in the classic English trick-taking game called Whist, W-H-I-S-T the rules of which were first formally published in 1742 by Edmund Hoyle. Fans of playing cards will likely recognize his last name from one of the most popular brands of playing cards that's still around today. Hoyle was a writer known for his works on the rules and play of multiple card games. An interesting fact about Hoyle, he was actually inducted into the Poker Hall of Fame in 1979, more than 200 years after he died, based solely on his contributions to card games and gaming in general. He actually died 60 years before the game of poker was even invented, and he is yet a member of the Poker Hall of Fame. I found that really interesting. So I know I started talking about the etymology of score, but when I find related topics of interest, I may veer off track a bit during this segment from time to time. If you enjoy hearing that extra information, let me know. Or if you'd prefer that I stick to just the etymology only, let me know that too. I am playing around with this segment. And if I find interesting information that I think you guys would like, I'm going to give it to you. But obviously, if you just want word history and nothing else, I'd be happy to do that as well. So that was the etymology of score. And that's it for this week's Board Game Blitz. Visit our website, boardgameblitz.com, to get links to all our social media pages, including our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Board Game Geek Guild. If you're enjoying the podcast and want to show us a little love, you can become a patron for as little as $1 a month. Just head to patreon.com slash boardgameblitz. Our patrons get a lot of benefits, including access to our private Slack channel, where you can chat with us directly anytime. And we're ridiculous. Now we are. Our theme song was composed by Andrew Morrow. 
Technical support provided by Toby Mao. Board Game Blitz is a proud member of the Dice Tower Network. Check out the other shows in the network by visiting DiceTowerNetwork.com. Until next time, vacation all I ever wanted. Vacation had to blitz away. Vacation don't want to game alone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. In the way to best fill their boards and earn victory points, and my alarm on my phone went off. Darn it. <laughs> okay, let's move on. We're gonna have some good bloopers. That's we got. Yep, yep. Yeah, Ambie, you will not be struggling for blo- we have bloopers. For, for days. bloopers, I just said bloopers. <laughs> I can't even say blooper without making another blooper. Kitten Clash, Baron Park. And Mythos, hell, we didn't talk about that. That's, nope, nope, no, no, no. I was wondering if you were going to do that since you just said it. <laughs> yep. And what's funny is I actually had a typo in there that I was able to skip because I had some fourth age. <laughs> I, met, I, was, I saw it in advance and skipped it, but then I messed that.